we keep looking for aliens? Aliens first appeared on a movie screen in 1902 when George Méliès released A Trip to the Moon. Humans have been fascinated by the possibility of life beyond the Earth for a long, long time. In fact, the curiosity of looking up and wondering what it's like out there has been part of human nature for tens of thousands of years. A Trip to the Moon was only the first of many alien appearances in movies. And the way we depict aliens in those movies actually opens a window into what we think of ourselves. I do think we should keep looking for aliens, because more than telling us about extraterrestrial life, looking for aliens t tells us about our own life. So today, I want to share with you the idea that, yes, we should keep looking for aliens, because the more we try looking out there, the more we end up looking in here. I'll share with you some of the challenges of space search, some of the technologies that get us out there, and what I've learned while exploring space. So let's start with the challenges. Suppose we want to find another world where life is currently thriving. If we just look at our neighborhood, we won't be super lucky. Venus and Mercury, the planets closer to the sun, are too hot. Mars has barely any atmosphere left and Jupiter and the other planets in the outer solar system are too cold. So, what if we go about and try to find a planet orbiting another star? This is Proxima Centauri. It's the closest star to our solar system, and it's 25 trillion miles away. This is Voyager 1. It's the fastest human-made spacecraft in interstellar space. It travels at a staggering 38,000 miles per hour. It could cross the US from the east coast of Maine to the west coast of California in just five minutes. But even at Voyager's speed, it would take us over 70,000 years to reach Proxima Centauri. While that's a very not feasible long journey, it does teach us a lot about what it means to search for alien life. And I think I have three very powerful lessons that I would like to share with you. First, remember we always have biases and assumptions. Second, be patient and anti-fragile, because the journey is very long. And third, let's embrace technological development Let's do it in through, st through intentional steps and make it better day by day. So let's start with the first one, thinking about biases and assumptions. Humans love creating patterns, models, equations. So when looking for life outside of the Earth, we look at what we know and we try creating patterns from there. So. That's how we end up with the iconic aliens in the movies who stand on two feet, use tools with two hands, and stare ahead with two eyes. Honestly, I don't think that's how aliens look like. I think they would probably look more like bacteria or a single cell phone guy. But what's the problem of depicting what we don't know based on what we do know? I'd say the answer is, at the same time, not at all a problem, and, oh, that's really bad. The reason why it's bad is that we are doing that based on only one single sample point, the way life developed here on Earth. And we don't know how it would have happened under different initial conditions. So we just have our models that try to predict how things would develop, but we don't have a way to confirm if those are correct. So we have to be aware of the limitations of our perspective. If our expectation is that aliens would look like us, that may cause us to miss life in any other form. But the good thing of using what we know to try to predict what we don't know is that, well, it's all we know. So we have to use our models to try to come up with solutions to problems we can't always predict. And of all those assumptions, what are the ones that could be useful in trying to find life outside the Earth? We believe the three main ingredients for life as we know it 
are the liquid water, the presence of energy, easily available energy, and the presence of basic organic chemistry elements, such as carbon and oxygen. And where would we be able to find this life soup? Well, the first idea was looking for somewhere that was similar to the Earth, with surface oceans of liquid water kept warm by the rays of energy from the nearest star. But in the solar system, the Earth is the only planet that is at the right distance from the sun to have surface oceans of liquid water. So if, what if we try going for other planets? Well, remember how far Proxima Centauri is? 70,000 years of travel? So for us to be able to keep searching for life without such a lengthy journey, we had to bust a huge assumption. The energy for the life formation does not need to come from a star. And as soon as we let go of that assumption, many places closer to the Earth became candidates for hosting life. One of them is Europa. Europa is a moon of Jupiter. It's five times further away from the Sun than the Earth is. And it receives less than 1% of the total solar power in watts than the Earth does. So its surface is completely covered by ice. There is, though, a great source of energy on Europa. The ocean tides caused, caused by Jupiter and its other moons. We believe the friction from those tides provide enough energy to keep an ocean with four times more liquid water than that here on Earth. We also believe the ocean in Europa has the main organic chemistry elements necessary for the life soup. So, liquid water, an easily available energy source, and the basic organic chemistry elements? Europa could be our currently closest inhabited companion. So we are super excited to go check it out. The only detail is that there is a very thick ice crust covering that ocean. And that ice crust is about 15 miles thick at a surface temperature of minus 280 Fahrenheit. So that leads me into the second lesson of exploring aliens, which is to be patient, anti-fragile, and enjoy the learning. Through the work I have been doing at MIT, Stone Aerospace, and NASA JPL, we have been developing probes to go through that thick layer of ice of Europa. We have our key challenge of trying to increase the energy transfer between probe and ice so that we could speed up that descent process. As of now, our models and experiments tell us it could take anywhere between 1 and 20 years for the probe to cross through the ice crust and dive into the ocean. While that's not 70,000 years, it's still a long journey. So we have to be patient and keep making progress every step of the way. And besides being patient during the exploration, we also need to be patient while doing the technological development for it. Normally, especially on the early stages of development, we are faced with wrong assumptions, experimental results that don't seem to make any sense, and many failed attempts. But that's what makes us learn a lot. We try to fail in the lab so we don't fail in space. And we use those failures to learn from the process. And that's how we end up with great hardware that goes into space and does a great job. And that's directly in line with the meaning of anti-fragility, which means to not only withstand hardships, but also improve from them and get back stronger after each setback. So let me tell you a personal story. Back in 2019, I was doing the first test campaign for my probes. I had only one probe, the MVP0. But there I was, with spreadsheets and test procedures and high hopes, expecting I would be able to get through five test runs in a week. Well, I came back from Stone Aerospace after that one week, but with only half a test done. I could either be discouraged by it, 
or I could use that failure to learn and to improve the design of my probe and the recovery methods. So that's a key learning from space exploration. We persevere. We learn how to use the stressors and the failures to make the entire system more robust. And that takes me to the third lesson of space exploration, which is to be grateful of the previous developments and use them to go ahead step by step. Nobody gets anywhere alone. Most accomplishments in life are built up on previous accomplishments. And we need to take step by step, learn, strategize, and then move ahead. That's why we are first learning a lot about the, the low Earth orbit before we can put ourselves into outer space. And sometimes we need to take small steps, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're going slow. You can be just taking strategic side steps before you can advance with confidence. And that's why we are first understanding the effects of space on the human body by having people living in the International Space Station for over 21 years. And now we are starting to create settlements for people on the moon, which is relatively nearby. And just after we have reduced the life threats, we are going to send humans to Mars. And let me tell you another way in which I learned to take slow strategic steps. Most of space exploration so far has been done by citizens of the US, Russia, or Europe. Only 12 countries have ever launched something into space. In my home country, Brazil, it's not one of them. Besides that, most countries consider space as national security, making it extremely hard for people from other countries, like myself, to work on space exploration. Faced with this barrier, I could have played it safe and stopped pursuing my dreams of searching for alien life. But that fragile moment is when you can transform yourself the most. And that's when we need to embrace change, make a strategic plan, and go for a plan of attack. So that's what I did. I start as a thermal mechanical engineer, which is a very strong field in Brazil, moved into working with executive airplanes, which is also strong in Brazil, and now in the US, I'm building space hardware, satellites, and probes for space exploration. <laughs> So, to sum it up, there are three powerful lessons we can learn from exploring space. First, remember you always have biases and assumptions. Think logically about them. Try to evaluate their validity and think what would have happened under different assumptions. Second, be patient, anti-fragile, and enjoy the learning. After all, the journey is where you spend the vast majority of your time. And third, be grateful of previous accomplishments and strategize your way forward step by step. As a young girl, I was mesmerized by the sky and all the spacecraft NASA would put out there. But I never thought that such technology would be accessible to a middle-class girl from a touristy island in Brazil. My future in aerospace wasn't assured. In fact, it was super limited. I had an excuse to give up. But I did not give up. I kept trying to achieve my dreams and striving to reach for my stars. And I would like to invite you all to also strive to keep reaching for your stars, whatever they may be. Find that thing that keeps you going. For me, that thing is exploring space. For me, looking for alien lives, it's my way of saying that I have not and will not give up. <laughs> I believe we will answer the question of whether or not we are alone in the universe. It's just a matter of time. Now what we can work on is the journey. So let's make the journey be worth it. Let's do our best. And if you could leave this talk with only one message, I would say that yes, we should keep looking for aliens. 
Because more than telling us about extraterrestrial life, looking for aliens teaches us about what it actually means to be human. It has taught me, for example, that both searching for aliens and being human are stories of hope, stories of failing, learning, and trying again. Thank you.